The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. All right. Will you all take your Bibles and uh, open to Genesis chapter 12? We left all the chairs in here from uh, Sunday, so we're all a little bit spread out. Uh, but uh, maybe we'll just leave it like this, though, in, in faith that God is going to just add to our Wednesday night study. Although we had, a, we had a leaders meeting last night, so I know that there's been a lot of things going on this week, so I wouldn't be surprised if some folks couldn't come tonight because they were at the leaders meeting yesterday. But uh, glad that we're all together tonight. Let's ask the Lord's blessing as we look to His Word tonight in Genesis 12. Father, thank You so much just for the opportunity and joy that we have to study Your Word. And Lord, we come not only to understand how You have worked in other people's lives as we study the life of Abraham, but Lord, we desire to apply these things to our own lives. Lord, it is really our heart to say that we've come tonight to be changed. So with that in mind, we have a humble heart, we have a teachable heart, and Lord, we just receive from your spirit tonight in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Genesis chapter 12, where we picked up, starting in verse 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will give you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse, uh, and one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All right, now here we meet Abram. Of course, he will later be called Abraham. The name Abram means exalted father, and he is a very key uh, man in all of Scripture. So he is a very, very important fellow that we're going to meet tonight. And uh, Abram is really called in Scripture the father of our faith. He is indeed uh, looked to by uh, Judaism. Uh, uh, Israel looked to him as their father. And of course, uh, Christianity looks to Abraham as a father of faith, an example of faith. And uh, Islam looks to them as the father of Ishmael, and Ishmael then being the father of all Arab nations. So all Arab nations trace their roots back to Abraham. And of course, Israel, through Isaac, traces their bloodline to Abraham. And of course, Christianity through faith. And so he's a very, very a pivotal and, and important man in Scripture. Much of Genesis is, is uh, given to him. And many times in the New Testament, he's referred to. Now, notice what it says here. The Lord said to Abram, it means exalted father. Interesting, he is not a father, not at this point. And he says, go forth from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land uh, which I will show you. All right, this is the call of Abraham. He's calling Abraham out of where he was. Now, we know as we look up a few verses that He was from a city of Ur. That's a simple name. You are the city of Ur, which was a coastal city over by the mouth of the river Euphrates. And now, actually, you can, uh, there's archaeological sites there now. It's not on the mouth of the Euphrates because the the, uh, uh, land has changed and shifted over time as the, the sediment from the river has built up a delta, and so now it's out farther. But Anyway, it is that city, and in that day, it was the center of civilization. It was the large city, a great economic port city. And uh, there in that city uh, was idolatry, licentiousness, worldly living, all kinds of worldly life. I mean, you know, you can just imagine, right? The parties, the scene, the whole thing. Everything you can imagine about the world, that's Earth. In fact, anytime you have a big city, you're going to have the same stuff. 
Okay, because anytime you have a, a, a bringing together of people in a concentrated place like a city, you're going to have the concentration of all of the elements of humanity. And much of it is bad. Do you understand what I'm saying? You put it all together and Ur was a worldly bad place. And there was no godliness. You know, at least we could say, well, maybe, you know, maybe in the city there's some influence of godliness. Unfortunately, no, it was a city of idolatry. And so here God calls Abram while he is in Ur, and he says, come out of there. Come out, leave the city, leave your relatives, leave your father's house, and I'm going to show you a land. And he says, I'm going to give you this land. It's going to be a land of promise, the promised land, all right? And then he says in verse, verse 2, and I will make you a great nation. I will make uh, and I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and so you will be a blessing. So he's calling Abram out, and he says, and here's my intention for you, Abram. I want you to know this. I want to bless you. My intention for your life is to bless you, all right? But here's the thing. I'm asking you to come out of that city and that licentious place. I'm asking you to come out of there, and I'm going to bless you. Now, Abraham, Abram, in order to... to, to to find God's blessing, he's got to believe God. He's got to believe that God's going to do what God said. So here he's making this promise, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. But here's the thing, you've got to listen to me. I'm asking you to come out of there because I'm not going to bless you in there. You've got to come out. All right. Now, there's a great illustration, of course, for us. Application for us. Jesus uh, uh, taught us. Paul taught us, and there, you can just see the, the, the scriptural admonition many, many times. Hey, you got to come out of there. You know, when God calls us, when God knocks on the door of our heart, He wants to come into our life. Yes, so He comes in, and then He calls us out. He's going, uh, let me come into your life. I'll change your life, man. But here's the thing. You let me in. We're going to have fellowship, and the next thing you know, I'm going to change you. I'm going to change your life, but here's the thing. I'm going to change it for good. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you with awesome things, but you've got to believe me. You've got to believe me on this. It's not going to happen here. Not in this city, not this licentious place. You've got to come out of that mess. You've got to come out of that party, and I will bless you, man. You see, so that's what he's saying. I'll do all these things for you. All right, and then he says at the end of verse 2, I love this. I was teaching this on Sunday, and you will be a blessing. In fact, it's actually not a prophecy here. It's actually a, a word of instruction. Be a blessing. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, make you a great nation. And here's the thing. Now you go and you be a blessing. Wherever you go, you be a blessing. There's a great word for us in that. When we understand how much God has blessed us. And in fact, that on Sunday was what I, I was trying to really get through to us. How much we really are blessed. You know, you look at Abraham. You look at all the incredible blessings that God intended for Abraham, and you got to step back and you say, wow, that's amazing, awesome. But then you have to really realize something about us. God has intended for everyone who is in Jesus Christ to be blessed. I mean, what is God's intention? I'm going to bless your life. In Jesus Christ, I'm going to bless your life. It's not my intention to hurt you. It's not my intention to be a killjoy. It's not my in intention to you know, make your life boring. I'm going to call you out so I can make you boring. I mean, can you imagine God saying that? I'm going to make you bored. Come out of that uh, licentious party life, and I'm going to make you bored. Oh, the blessings of boredom. Can, can anybody relate to this? I mean, that's not what God is calling us to. Look, come out. I've got some great boredom in store for you. You've got to come into Christ, you know, man. Oh, I can't wait. Where do I sign up? That's not what God is in mind at all. I will bless you, and then he describes in Jesus Christ the incredible, he says, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies is in Jesus Christ, and it's for you. You're seated at the right hand of God. At the right hand of God, the scripture says, are pleasures forevermore. I want to bless your life. I want to fill your life with something absolutely amazing, but you've got to believe me. There's an element here of believing God you got to trust me on this. I really will bless you. And he continues on. All right. Verse 3. I'll bless those who bless you. Not only will I'm asking you to go and be a blessing, but here's the thing. Wherever you go, I will bless those who bless you. 
And anyone who curses you, I will curse. I'm with you. Now, it's an interesting thing when you look at this. Is God on Abraham's side? Is God on Abraham's side? In other words, is God saying, I'm with you, Abraham. Is that what really God is saying here? I think something a little different. I think what God is saying is, Abraham, you be on my side. You be with me, and then you will find the blessing. You see the difference? Many people are a little confused on this point. They think, oh, God is with me wherever I go. Yes, that's true. But therefore, is like God on your side, whatever you do? No, God's not on your side. Here's the thing is, you're on God's side. If you're on God's side, then you're standing where God wants you to stand. And therefore, God's going to say, therefore, I'm going to bless you. When you stand where God wants you to stand, God's going to bless you. I don't know how. Well, God knows. There's a trust of God that comes with it. I will stand where God wants me to stand, and I'll trust him that he will do what he said. I will stand where he wants me to stand. There's, a, there's something so important to understand there. So important to understand. I remember, oh, how many years ago was this? I, I bet it was, let's see, we've been to church now for <laughs> 18 years. And so I'm thinking this was like oh, 14, 15 years ago, right? Long time ago. I'll never forget this Sunday morning. Sunday morning, I mean, we're only church about three years or so. However many years. All right, and uh, this particular Sunday morning, I will never forget this Sunday morning. I'm getting the equipment up. We were at a different building. We had to haul the equipment, right? So we're hauling the equipment, and the worship leader comes in, and he's got a stack of files. These are the music files for the day. And he comes in, and uh, he, he, he slams the, the, the files down. I said, well, what, what's up? And uh, he said, I'm not leading worship today. And I said, really? Well, what's going on? And I said, me and my, my wife, we had a fight, and I'm not going to lead worship. And he just he gets in his car, and he peels off. Oh, my goodness, you know. Wow. And uh, so I'm, okay, and so uh, uh, I guess I'll lead worship today. And so a little bit later, uh, one, one of our ministry leaders uh, wasn't there. And I said, well, where's so-and-so today? No, she's, she's not coming in. She's, she's dealing with depression today. I thought, really? That, that really? Okay. And uh, so a little bit later, uh, you know, I'm still getting stuff ready, and uh, one, of, one of our other leaders comes in, and he says, uh, Rich, I just wanted you to know I'm quitting today. Really? Okay. <laughs> and uh, so it was like me and the piano player, and, uh, and I drew him aside, and I said, you know what? This, we're in spiritual warfare. We are in spiritual warfare. And you know what's something? I'm not going to have it. <laughs> are you with me? He said, I'm with you. I said, I don't know where we're going to go, but I'm, we're going to go somewhere today. He said, you lead, I'll follow, man, let's go. And I'll praise God for you, man. And so I was so like, mmm, you know, the enemy is not getting away with this today, you know? No way. We are in spiritual warfare, and I know where I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand on the rock. I know where I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand on the tower of the high king. He is my Lord, and I'll stand on that rock. And therefore, I will not be moved. Amen. So I, I was like, hmm, you know, hmm. And I, and I got up there this morning, and I started leading worship. You know, and I'm telling you, man, the spirit was just moving. And I draw everybody together, you know, the spirit was moving in that place. And uh, man, the worship was just, you could just feel the spirit just moving in people's hearts and lives. Halfway through it, I said, we're going to pray. We are going to pray right now. Let's break up into small groups, and we're going to pray. And I said, anyone here, you pray for, you pray for marriages. You pray for anyone who's in depression. You pray for, and, and I just started praying like this. And they started, and you can just see like a cloud was just lifting. You, you know what I'm saying? It was like, it was like the clouds were like parting, and the Spirit of God was pouring out. And you see what I'm saying? There is a place that says, God, wherever you are is where I will be. And therefore, if you are there and I am there, I know it's a place of blessing, and I will not be moved. Did not God say, stand on the rock, let your foundation be the rock of Jesus Christ, and then when the storm comes, when the wind comes, when the wave smashes against that place, your house will stand. Amen? All right, that's what he's saying. Am I on, God on your side? No, you're on God's side. And therefore, it's a place of blessing. Verse 3, so Abram went forth. I like that. So Abram went forth. As the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. 
Now, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Oops, wait a minute. Haran just jumped in here. What happened? Well, what happened was this. He was called out of Ur of Chaldees, but he didn't exactly follow completely what God said. Yes, he did listen to what God said, and he left the city of Ur, but he didn't really, truly do everything that God asked. For example, he brought his relatives with him. Now, why was this so important? Well, his relatives were idolaters. The, 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 the moon god, Nana, that was the name of the moon god there, they're all idolaters. And so he, Abram brings all his family with him. And he doesn't go to the land that he was called to. He stops in Haran, the city called Mountainous. It's the city of the mountain of the north. And he stops there. And he camps there. And he lives there until his father dies. His father, Terah, dies. Now, what's interesting and important to understand is that, okay, the blessings of God were on hold. They were waiting. They were waiting. Abram is an example of faith, yes, but he's an example of one who grows in faith. He's not a giant, you know, right out of the gates. He grows in faith. And so you see Abram, yeah, he listened, but he didn't fully listen. He goes to Haran, waits there. His father finally dies at 75 years old. We just read it in verse 4, 75 years old. He's an old man, but he's doing what God asked him to do. He's finally going to do what God asked him to do. And now we're going to see. As he, as, as he listens, as he obeys, as he trusts, God will bless him. But he's still growing in his faith. We're going to see that he's still growing as we continue. All right. So Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew. Okay, now, you're bringing Lot along, and he said, leave them. But he's bringing Lot along, and all their possessions, which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Mamre, or Morah, excuse me. Now the Canaanite was there in the land. All right, so this oak, this great tree, was a, a mark of some kind. He passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem. That's a famous place in Scripture. To the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was there in the land, so they're in the land of promise, but it's a fairly barren, you know, we're going to go there in a few weeks, I cannot wait. In those days in particular, it was a very dry and barren, rocky, dusty place. And this is the place that the Lord is going to give him. And the Lord appeared to Abram and he said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel. It wasn't called Bethel quite yet, but it was a reference that the readers would understand. He headed there to the mountain on the east of Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. Now it's interesting here. As he's journeying through this place, God is promising him, to your descendants, I'm going to give this land. The problem is, he's 75 years old, he has no descendants, he has no son, he's an old man, his wife is older at this point. Uh, his wife would be in, in her 50s, more than likely, perhaps 60s. And so she's getting quite old herself, and uh, he has no son. But we're going to study soon, of course, the miraculous way that God provided for him a son. So Abram is called, Abram and Abraham is called a father by many. It's a very interesting story. In fact, if you would turn in your Bibles to John, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Here we have a very, very interesting interchange where there is a discussion about who is Abraham's son. All right, as we look at this, we're going to begin in John 8, 31. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. 
Famous words. They answered, We are Abraham's offspring. We're Abraham's children. And have never yet been enslaved to anyone. That wasn't true. At that very moment, they were enslaved to Rome. But nevertheless, we are Abraham's offspring and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say that we shall become free? Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And a slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son, he does remain forever. If therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's offspring. Now this is important. I know that you are Abraham's offspring. Yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore you also do the things which you have heard from your father. They answered and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. This is a great confrontation. This is amazing, by the way. Okay, if you're Abraham's children, then be like Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I have heard from God, and this Abraham did not do. So, therefore, you are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not the ones born to fornication. Now, do you understand what they just said there? They just called him a name. I'm not going to repeat the name. Do you know what I'm saying? They just called him a cuss word here. They just said that his mother wasn't married when she had him. Are you with me on this? They just insulted him in a very big way. They said, we were not the ones born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said, I love his answer. If God were your father, you would love me. I just think that is so pointed. Really? Is God your father? If God is your father, then you would love me. For I have proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not come on my own initiative, but he. He sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You, therefore, are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. and He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and he is a father of lies. But I speak... Uh, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God, he hears the words of God. And for this reason, you do not hear them because you're not of God. I mean, this was a woo, one of those, you know, you just, if you were like there listening to this conversation, you'd start backing up. You know what I'm saying? Whoa, this is a, one of those really, really heavy conversations. But it was all started with, who is Abraham's son? Who is Abraham's child? Who is like Abraham? Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, that's where it started. And Abraham's children. And in fact, if you do a scriptural search and a study of this, we know this. It is the one who believes God.